Alrighty, Shabbat Shalom. And Shabbat Shalom to those who are listening with us this evening. Uh, let's start the Bible study in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we come before your throne and we bless you and we praise you, Father, and we thank you for another week of life. We thank you for the blessings that you give us. We thank you, Father, that in a corrupt world that you've called us out of this world into your marvelous light. We thank you, Father, for the redemption of the nation of Israel. And Father, we just pray and we ask your blessing on the Shabbat. We pray that you will sanctify your people, help to take them out of the world, help us to enter your rest. And we pray, Father, for your remnant all over the world. We thank you and we bless you and we praise you. <clears throat> and we ask you to lead this study by your spirit. In the name of your son, Yeshua, we pray. Hallelujah. Alrighty, we are now in Revelation, the fifth chapter. And like I said last week, that uh, the first three chapters of Revelation was basically an introduction to the book, uh, and then letters to the seven congregations. And then last week was literally really the beginning of the vision, the beginning of what's being seen. And now it's going to start getting more into it. Uh, we start off here in re chapter five, and I saw on the right side, of the one sitting on the throne, a scroll having been written within and on the back, having been sealed with seven seals. So now we're starting to get into uh, the nuts and bolts of the book, that basically there are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, and then there's seven bowls. So we see it's a progression that's going on of judgment that's coming from Yahweh, and the seals, which are the Start out with the first four, the four horsemen of the apocalypse that we'll get into next week. But this is the beginning of it. This is the beginning of announcing now of these seals or these uh, scroll having been written with seven seals. So what's interesting about it is, and I know for the ones who are listening to this, you can't see it. But what I'm doing is I'm taking a piece of paper and I'm just rolling it up. I'm rolling the paper from end to end because actually that's what a scroll is. Scrolls were used before books were used and we know probably uh, everybody listening to this is one time in their life whether it's a picture or in real life you've seen a Torah scroll, right? It's a big scroll. It rolls from side to side. You open it up and you can see it. Uh, the Bible was actually made in uh, the town of Byblos, Lebanon, and that's why it's called Bible from Byblos. It is the first book that was actually bound, that the uh, chapters in it are bound together. Whereas before that, like I said, we had scrolls. So this is a scroll, and there's seven seals on the scrolls. A seal was something that would keep the scroll closed. So once the the uh, the seals were on there, and particularly when they were the seals of the king, that meant that nobody at all could touch that scroll. Because if you opened a scroll that was sealed by the king's signet ring, and they were usually sealed with clay, the clay would press uh, onto the scroll and, and just with wax and, and slightly seal it. If that was opened up, uh, literally it would have been the death penalty. It would have meant that you got death. So with these seven seals, as we'll see as we get into it next week, once the seals are starting to come up, the seals coming off is opening this scroll, which is the book of Revelation. And what does it say here? It's written on both sides, one side and the back side, which is very rare for scrolls. Scrolls are made from papyrus fibers, and the way that a, uh, the papyrus is put together... Uh, it runs horizontally on the inside. So it's very, very difficult to write on the back side once you've written on the inside. And that's why hardly ever, although we do see it, I'm going to show you an example here in a second from the book of Ezekiel, but hardly ever do you see scrolls that are written on both sides. Most of the time the scroll is written on one side. So if we go to Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10, Ezekiel chapter 2, 9 and 10, And what's very interesting is, last week, uh, when we were going over chapter 4, 
with the four faces of the Messiah and the four living creatures, right? We were going over Ezekiel chapter 1. Because it's a parallel of the living creatures with those four faces. Remember the face of the lion, the face of the ox, the face of the man, and the face of the eagle. And we said they're representative of the four good news messages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So as we're looking at the probably the first 12 chapters of the book of Ezekiel of parallels to the end time. And a lot of it in the book of Revelation. So here we're in chapter 2. And in verse 9, he says, And I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and behold, a roll of a book was on it, a scroll. And he spread it before me, and it was written on the face and the back. And written on it were weepings and mournings and woe. Weepings and mournings and woe. So we see here's another example where a scroll is written on, on both sides. Uh, when the Ten Commandment plaques were given on Mount Sinai, now that wasn't a scroll that was written on stone, but also that was written on both sides. So uh, it could mean that things are simultaneously going on, that the seven seals and the seven trumpets are going on at the same time, uh, or it could just mean that everything is happening quickly, that it's not a prophecy that's going to be going on like the Daniel nine prophecy for 490 years, that this is something happening quickly, but it is noted uh, that it's a scroll written inside and out with seven seals. Verse 2, And I saw a strong terror proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? So if we go to chapter 10 and verse 1, we see similar wording. Chapter 10 and verse 1, I saw another strong messenger coming down out of the heaven, having been clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow of a cloud was on his head, and his face was as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So uh, we see this, that possibly the messenger could be Yeshua. We're not sure, but we do see similar wording like that in the book of Daniel. But uh, we see the same thing, a strong messenger proclaiming with a great voice. And what is he saying? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? So we're seeing that it's not just a matter of Yahweh telling somebody open up the seals or open up the scroll. It's a matter of somebody has to be worthy because like I say, the book of Revelation is a very, very interesting book because it's the only book in the Bible that is actually a history of something that hasn't happened yet, right? So here it is. All the rest of the Bible we see is the history of the Garden of Eden, the history of creation, the history of the flood, the history of Abraham, right? And Isaac and Jacob. And then the history of the nation of Israel. And then the history of the diaspora in Babylon. And then the history of coming back after Babylon. And then the history of when Yeshua was born. And then we have from the seven congregations in Revelation, which my book, The Gates of Hell Shall Not Prevail Against Her, is based on the history of the true congregation of Yeshua from 30 AD all the way up until today. So basically everything we're seeing is history. But here is a history that hasn't happened yet. So it's a very, very interesting book because it's not only a history that hasn't happened, so it's almost like a mystery, but also beside that, it's a history that we're living in, that it hasn't happened yet, but we're living in this time and some things in Revelation are actually happening today. So it's not a book that is completely, somebody can say it's for 100 years from now. No, the book of Revelation has already been open. The book is being revealed. The book is being uh, uh, fulfilled as we're giving this study right here. But somebody's got to be worthy to be able to fulfill it. Why? Because the book of Revelation is not only about the wrath of Yahweh on a a sinful mankind that has gone away from his way, but it's also about the redemptive work of Yeshua's remnant and that remnant making themselves right in the body of Messiah. So that's a prophecy that hasn't happened yet. So you need somebody who's going to be worthy because the bride of Messiah can't be ready without the blood of the Messiah to bring to them first. So it's like it's, it's a whole circular pattern as we see that's going on here. And then verse 3, And no one in heaven was able to open the scroll, nor to see it, neither on the earth, 
nor underneath the earth. So again, somebody's got to be worthy. Somebody's got to have this honor. And it's not just an honor like when you get invited somewhere. You know, if you were invited to uh, the royal wedding, what an honor that would be, right? To be invited to the the royal wedding that's coming up next month with uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Maybe it would be, maybe it wouldn't be an honor, but, but it would be an honor. But that would just be like an honor to be there. But it, it wouldn't be an honor the way it's talking about here when they're talking about and no one in heaven was able to open the scroll nor to see it neither on the earth nor, nor underneath the earth. And I wept much, verse 4, because no one worthy was found to open and to read the scroll nor to see it. So it's not just a matter of an honor of somebody that's being honored to do it. It's an honor that somebody had to qualify to be able to do this. And... The weeping is coming here because no one was worthy found to open and to read the scroll nor to see it. And then in verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, remember the 24 elders from the chapter before we talked about, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion being of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he overcame, that word literally means to conquer, he overcame, so as to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So we see somebody has qualified. He overcame and he qualified the same way we're told in Scripture, right? What did we? What were we reading to the seven letters to the seven congregations? For him that overcomes, I will give you this. For him that overcomes, I will give eternal life. For him that overcomes, I will give you the hidden manner. So we need to overcome the same way that Yeshua overcame and now is was. Qualified, He's worthy to open this up, this scroll. Uh, verse 5 is also very interesting in several other ways. Like I said, literally it means to conquer, that he's conquered. Like it says in uh, John 16, 33, In the world you will have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I have overcome, I have conquered the world. So Yeshua has conquered the world. He has defeated Satan. He, he, he has... Uh, qualified to be the ruler of the earth. And right now, it's just like I talked about this before, when you have an election. There was an election in the United States in November of 2016. Donald Trump uh, beat Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama was the president at that time, but Barack Obama didn't immediately leave office the next day. No, what happens is, between November 7th, I think it was, or November 8th, whenever that uh, election day was, until January 17th, I believe it was, where President Trump took office. Now, that's the time period where the new president has to get his cabinet ready. He has to qualify. He's got to get all the people ready that's going to serve. And that's the time period we're in now. Satan has already been defeated in the election, although it's not an election, but he's been defeated. He's not the ruler of this world anymore, although we are in this time period where he still controls things. But Yeshua is simply getting his cabinet together, which we are part of, and getting ready for the day that he returns to this earth, that we will be ruling with him, with it. So, uh, but this is one of the only times uh, where he's talked about as the lion being of the tribe of Judah. Now, what's very interesting about that is, is because we know that Yeshua is the king of Jerusalem, right? And we know Yeshua is Melchizedek. I'm not going to go there today. I have studies on this and messages on this. Uh, from Hebrews, the fifth chapter, Hebrews, the seventh chapter. But without a shadow of a doubt, Melchizedek is a title. It's not a personal name. Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. Only Yeshua is the king of righteousness. Uh, but Melchizedek is also called the king of Salem in Genesis, the 14th chapter. Salem being Jerusalem. Yerushalayim, the cornerstone of peace. So here, though, now today, if you look, the actual flag, the Jerusalem flag, is the Lion of Judah. You know, we, we see that. You can buy them when you're here in Israel. But in the Bible, you don't see a lot of places. Although today it is a big thing with Messianic people. Messianic people know Yeshua is the Messiah, and they know that he's from the tribe of Judah, and they know that that's part of the prophecy. So many times in Messianic circles, we will see 
the line of Judah being related to Yeshua, rightfully so. But in the Bible, you don't find it that much. And this is one of the places you do find it over here in Revelation 5 and verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion being of the tribe of Judah. Now, that also comes from Genesis 49. Let's go there, 9 through 12. Genesis 49 and 9 through 12. He says, Judah is a lion's whelp. My son, you have risen up from the prey. He stoops, he crouches like a lion, and like a lioness, who can arouse him? And that's why the word for lion in Hebrew is Ariel. And very interesting, in uh, chapter 29 of the book of Isaiah, it's the only time in Scripture where Jerusalem is called Ariel. Woe to you, Ariel, Ariel, you know, the city of, of Ariel. And it's a prophecy actually about the end time in Jerusalem being destroyed. And they're called Ariel, they're a lion. And like a lion is who can arouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. And in the Hebrew, that word is Shiloh. Shiloh, like the place Shiloh where the Ark of the Covenant was. So, and the obedience of the people to him. So we see here that Judah is like a lion's whelp, and he crouches like a lion, and like a lion who can rouse him. So this is where the lion of Judah comes from, and then it's repeated over here in chapter 5 of Revelation. Uh, it also says the root of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Why does it say the root of David? Because Isaiah 11.1, 1, Isaiah 11.1, 1, we went over this before with the seven spirits of Yahweh, which I won't go over again right now. But Isaiah 11.1. 1. And a shoot goes out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch will bear fruit out of his roots. A shoot goes out from the stump of Jesse. Very interesting. Why doesn't it say a, a shoot goes forth from the stump of David, King David, right? Because the prophecy was to David, not to David's father. Matter of fact, except David's father being mentioned in Scripture, we really... Don't see David's father saying anything at all except when uh, the prophet Samuel comes to the house to anoint the king over there. We briefly see Jesse there saying where his sons are. But you never really hear Jesse say anything else beside that in all the Bible. Certainly we don't see Jesse talking with Yahweh. And here it says a shoot goes out from the stump of Jesse. Because it's showing that when the Messi when the Messiah would come... David would not be a big dynasty, even though the promise was to the seed of David. Yahweh said it to him in 2 Samuel 7, that a seed of his would be ruling on the throne in Jerusalem forever. But this is showing that it's a stump, right? The tree is cut down, the tree of the house of David. And there's only a stump there. And a shoot is coming out of the stump. What is a shoot? It's a green growth. So it's showing the stump may be cut, but it's not dead. And there's growth that's coming out of there. And the Messiah is going to come forth, not in a time where there's a king from the line of David that's strong, ruling the earth. It's going to come at a time where Israel, and particularly Judah, is not strong. And that's exactly what happened when Yeshua was born. Israel was not even a sovereign nation. They were run by the Romans at that time. So this is what the prophecy is showing us, that... It, and it comes from the stump of Jesse. Why? Because Jesse is the father of David. So it's going back to David's humble beginnings before he was great, before he was king, when he was just a shepherd boy. And a branch will bear fruit out of his roots. That word is netzar for branch. And what does it say? That Yeshua will be a netzarian, a Nazarean, right? A netzar. So there's a connection there with him the same way. So... Very interesting that in Revelation uh, 5 5, this is all connecting the line of Judah uh, with the connection of the Messiah and the root of David all coming together. Behold, the lion being of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, overcame so as to open the scroll and to loosen its seals. Uh, Romans 15 and verse 12. Romans, the 15th chapter, in verse 12.
says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall be, and he rising up to rule the nations on him, nations will hope. So this is a prophecy coming uh, in the end of the book of Romans by the apostle Paul. Maybe I'll even start in verse 10. And again, he says, rejoice nations with his people. And again, praise the master Yahweh, all the nations and praise him, all the people. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall be. And he rising up to rule the nations, on him nations will hope. So, right now, Yahweh does everything within judicial order. And up to now, he's only made covenant with the nation of Israel. He's redeeming the tribes of Israel, all 12 tribes in the end time, not just the tribe of Judah. But when he returns to the earth, when the son of David returns to the earth, Yeshua Messiah, then Yeshua will make covenant with every nation on earth. And that's what it says here. So this is the promise that we see also in Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 43. And many times that the promise, the messianic promise is not just for the redemption of the tribes of Israel, but it's also redemption of all the tribes on the earth that he will make covenant with them at that time. And verse six, and I saw and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures And in the midst of the elders was a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim, having been sent out into all the earth. So we went over this before with the seven spirits. I won't go over that again in Isaiah 11. But that's what they're talking about when they're talking about the seven spirits of Yahweh. But in the midst of the throne, he sees a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. So first, the lamb having been slain. And like I said, when you're looking in Scripture, uh, even throughout the New Testament, you really don't find the concept of the Messiah being a a slain lamb very much. You know, the same ways you don't see the concept of the, the Messiah being, like I said, the Lion of Judah. We see it here in Revelation. We see it in the book of Genesis at the end, but not... There's 300 Messianic prophecies. You don't see it many other places. But what's interesting about it is when you go to the book of Isaiah, I'm going to give you two uh, scriptures on this, one from the Brit Hadashah and one from the Tanakh. When you go to Isaiah 53, which is the most powerful Messianic chapter in all of the Bible, uh, I did last year. I think it's a four, maybe even five-part series on who is the Messiah of Israel. Very, very powerful series, if you want to listen to it, if you've never heard it. But when we go to Isaiah 53, it is the most powerful messianic chapter in all the Bible showing that Yeshua is the Messiah. And what's very interesting is, for time immemorial almost, the Israelites have been doing Torah readings throughout the year on Shabbat, and every week they have a rotation of the Torah reading throughout the year. So you will see, you can go online and you can find this, you know, every week what Torah uh, portion is being read. And then they have a Haftarah, the the, uh, prophets. So, and the writing. So you'll see that there'll be a Torah portion and then a portion coming from the prophets and the writing. And do you know what's very interesting? That Isaiah 53 is the only chapter in the whole book of Isaiah that is skipped. They go from Isaiah 52 to Isaiah 54. Why is that? If, if Isaiah 53 is not talking about Yeshua, like uh, and to, which they always did, every ancient rabbi ever always said it's talking about the Messiah, and it's only uh, with uh, Mammonites in the year 1000 that they started to say, no, this is talking about the nation, it's not talking about the Messiah, but that's for another day. But I just want to make the point that this chapter is skipped in the Torah readings by the Jews because they know it's talking about the Messiah who was Yeshua. But in verse 7, he says he, talking about the Messiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. But he did not open his mouth, just like Yeshua, when he was taken before Pilate and he was taken before Herod and he was taken before the high priest and they were accusing him and beating him. He stayed quiet. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a you before her shearers is dumb, so he opened on his mouth. So here we see the only scripture in the Tanakh showing that he's being led as a lamb to the slaughter. And then when we get to uh, 
the Brit Hadashah, we go to John 1 in verse 29. John 1 in verse 29. Maybe I'll even start in verse 27. Or verse 26. John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but one stands in your midst, whom you do not know. This one it is who has come after me, who also existed before me, of whom I am not worthy that I should loosen the strap of his sandal. These things took place in Beth Abara, at the crossing of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. On the morrow, John saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of Elohim, who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. So out of nowhere, we see that term, the Lamb of Elohim. And then, when you get in the book of Revelation, I believe it's around 27 times or so that that word, Lamb of Yah, is in the book of Revelation. That's why I said, I'm not saying 100%, but I think when we're looking at which John wrote Revelation, we would have to at least be able to consider that it could have been John the Baptist uh, that possibly had wrote, written Revelation. And that's one of the reasons when we see that term, Lamb of Yah, you only see it coming from John, John the Baptist himself. And then we see it in the book of Revelation. And of course, though, it is in the good news of John the Apostle. So you could also make a good case for John the Apostle. But uh, I don't think you could actually say for sure. I'm just giving you the different uh, ideas that we might be able to have. So we see the Lamb of Yah slain from the beginning of uh, the world, right? And also, we see that this sacrifice, and I saw and behold in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures in the midst of the elders was a lamb standing as, as having been slain. So he's standing as having been slain. And it's written in a very odd tense where it's like in perpetuity. It's ongoing. So he's as having been slain. And why is it saying that? Because Yeshua's sacrifice, if we go to Hebrews 10 and verse 10, Yeshua's sacrifice is ongoing. It's an ongoing sacrifice. That's why Passover is coming up here in a couple of weeks. And we don't have to kill a lamb for Passover because a lamb was already killed. And that lamb is Yeshua, the Lamb of Yah. So he is our Passover lamb, as it says in 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 8. So here we have uh, Hebrews 10, in verse 10. By which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua Messiah once for all. And indeed, every priest stands day by day ministering and often offering the same sacrifices, which can never take away the penalty of sins. But he, Yeshua... Offering but one sacrifice for sins, sat down in perpetuity at the right hand of Yahweh. From then on, expecting until his enemies are placed as a footstool under his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected in perpetuity the ones being sanctified. So that's the key that Yeshua sacrificed. It's an ongoing sacrifice. He only had to do it once, but that sacrifice covers every sin from Adam to sins that even had haven't happened yet because he is the eternal creator he has no beginning no end he coexisted with Yahweh the father from the very beginning and since it talks about in Colossians that all things were made through him and by him and for him and nothing exists without him and because of his supremacy only the creator of the universe could do that if he was not the creator of the universe as I'll get into a little later uh, it would be idolatry. But because he's the creator of the universe, his life is worth equal to all his creation put together. And he has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim. Again, I'm not going to go through the seven spirits again in uh, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. But seven horns and seven eyes. Seven eyes, again, it's showing the completeness that there's nothing that happens in this earth that Yahweh doesn't see. Seven is the number of fulfillment or the number of completion. So, a matter of fact, within Revelation, uh, we have, I think it's around 48, 49 sevens. <laughs> you have seven sevens because there's uh, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven this, seven last cherubs. And you see, because it is the completion of everything happening in the end time. So, the seven eyes are Yahweh's uh, dominance and his 
uh, omnipotent uh, spirit throughout all the earth, seeing everything that goes on, and the seven horns. Remember, the horns show uh, power. They show authority. And that's why he says there's seven horns. Uh, when you see Deuteronomy 33, 17, Deuteronomy 33, verse 16 and 17, Deuteronomy 33, 16, and 17. It says, And with the best of the earth in his fullness, and the good of him who dwelled in the bush, let him come to the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the separated one of his brothers. And again, that word that comes is Netzar. He's separated. Now, this is, this is when the blessing of Moses is going out to the 12 tribes. And, of course, Joseph is getting the double blessing. But then in verse 17, it says, His glory is as the firstborn of his ox, and the horns of the wild ox are his horns. With them he shall butt the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the myriads of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So, again, the horns are showing power. The horns are showing authority. The horns are showing strength. And we see Joseph having a double blessing there that's coming from that. In Revelation 13, we see it in another way, to the beast power. And what do we see? Revelation 13 and verse 1. And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on the horns, ten crowns, and on the heads, names of blasphemy. So again, we see the beast power the same. So it doesn't matter whether it's good authority or bad authority. Horns represent authority they represent power. Uh, in the book of Daniel 8, verse 3. Book of Daniel, 8th chapter, verse 3. It says, Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram was standing before the canal having two horns. And two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up first. So what is it showing? The higher horn has what? He has more authority. And I saw the ram budding westward and northward and southward, so that no beast could stand before him, and none could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, and behold, a male of the goats came from the west over the face of the earth and did not touch the ground. And the he-goat had an outstanding horn between his eyes, right? He had an outstanding horn showing the authority of that uh, that he goat that's there. Back to Revelation 5 and verse 7. And he came and took the scroll out of the hand of him sitting on the throne. So again, two separate beings. Yahweh the Father is on his throne. The Lamb is in the midst. He's taking the scroll out of the hand of Yahweh the Father. And when he took the scroll... The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having harps and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Uh, if you go to Revelation 8, in verse 3 and 4, we see, And another cherub came and stood on the altar, having a golden censer. And many types of incense were given to him, that he should give them with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints out of the hand of the cherub before Elohim. So, wow, when you really think of this concept here, and there's a lot of imagery that's in the book of Revelation, but this is really profound, that in the sanctuary of Yahweh, there was always incense that was burning on the second altar. There was an altar outside the sanctuary. Of course, that was the altar for sacrifice, for killing animals. There was an altar across the Kidron Valley that was there for the sacrifice of the red heifer. And then there was a small altar that was right before you came into the Holy of Holies, right inside the, uh, the door there that was used for burning incense. And actually, the priest would burn the incense and the, the smoke would fill the Ark of the Covenant so that he wouldn't actually see the Ark because he couldn't see the Ark and survive. But here the imagery is that this incense, this good smelling incense is the prayers of the saints that Yahweh is pleased with us. And I say, and I want to do a, a, a message again pretty soon on the power of prayer. But when you really think about it as children of Yahweh, I mean, Yahweh is merciful to everybody. We see in the Bible where there's times where he answered prayers of Nahum, the, the uh, Syrian, right? That had leprosy. He wasn't an Israelite. And other people that he had mercy on, you know. But at the end of the day, 
the people that Yahweh hears the most, the ones that have access to his throne, are his children. So literally, when you're praying, you put your head down and you start closing your eyes and praying to Yahweh, you are literally going before his throne in heaven and your prayer is like sweet incense to him. So that's what he says and that's why we never want to take for granted the power of the prayer. And that's why we don't just speak Yahweh is exalted, he's almighty, and we want to, we want to glorify his name, we want, to, we want to be humbled before him, we want to think that we're talking to the almighty creator of the universe when we're praying. And that this is the way he's looking at it, as bowls of incense that the cherubs are bringing up before him, are the prayers of the saints. And literally, it's the prayers of the sanctified ones. That word literally means sanctified ones, because sometimes people say, oh, saints are... Catholic or they're pagan. No. Catholic saints are pagan. They do sainthood and all that stuff. That's pagan. But the word saint literally means a sanctified one, a set apart one. That's all it means. And who are the saints or the sanctified ones? The believers. The ones who are in covenant relationship. Those are the ones who are the sanctified ones. Uh, Verse 9. And they sing a new song. Praises they're singing, right? They're singing a new song of praises saying, Worthy are you to receive the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and by your blood you purchased them to Elohim out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So we see that in Matthew 28, what did Yeshua say to the disciples? To go throughout all the world, right? Into every nation preaching the good news because the tribes of Israel have been disbanded and through all the earth. So Yahweh is calling back the tribes. So he's sending his disciples into all the earth to call back the tribes. And at the same rate, right, we know from Romans, the 11th chapter, that Israel's diaspora became salvation to the nations. Because now in the end time, as this good news message must go into all nations to call back the Israelites back into covenant relationship and back to the land of Israel, anybody of any nation, any race, any color, any creed, it doesn't make a difference, can join Yahweh in covenant and become part of that covenant. As Yahweh is not a respecter of persons. So this is what he's saying here. He bought them out of them, and they're singing this song, and they're saying, worthy to him, because they were slain, and by his blood he purchased them. Mark 10 and verse 45. Mark the 10th chapter and verse 45. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the sake of many. So he gave his life as a ransom, his life for our life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. And each of us has committed crimes, sins, worthy of death. Passover is coming in a few weeks. It's the most solemn day of the year. Why? Because you have to go into that Passover ceremony with a humble attitude and realize that your sins put the Messiah of Israel to death. It wasn't the Jews, it wasn't the Pharisees, it wasn't the Romans, it was you. It was your sins, because like I always say, if every single person in the whole world had never sinned but you, the plan would be the same. If you go to uh, 1 Corinthians 6.20, 1 Corinthians 6.20, Let's start in verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a sanctuary with the Holy Spirit in you, which you have from Elohim, and you are not of yourself? You were bought with a price. Then glorify Elohim in your body and your spirit, which belong to Elohim. So literally, I was saying this last week in the message, that being in a, in a body is, is a form of a handicap. Because we're limited. We're limited. Our mind is, should be a spiritual mind, the mind of Messiah. And yet we're limited in this body. We can't travel as the speed of thought as, as, as a spirit being can. Uh, we need food and water and air to survive. So it's limited to a degree. And we are to glorify Yahweh in our body because I fry tooth for tooth, life for life. And we have been bought and paid for and we belong to Yahweh and we belong to Yeshua. 
And in this world we're living in, particularly in the Laodicean era, I just don't think that people get that. I don't believe they really, really understand what that means. Uh, because everything you see around you in the world is the total opposite of that. Everything is for what you want, what's best for you, to please you. It's a selfish, self-seeking, prideful, pleasure-seeking world. And people think just because they're not like their neighbor or they're not like the people in the world, that that makes them good and it really doesn't. And we are to sacrifice our life. Our life need, in this world needs to be sacrificed. Romans 12 says we are to be living sacrifices because Yeshua was a living sacrifice to us. And everything that he did was to do the will of the Father. And everything we do should be to do the will of him, which is doing the will of the Father. In verse 10, And he made them kings and priests to our Elohim, and they shall reign on the earth. So while wow. Revelation 1.6, we went over this before. Revelation 1.6. And he made us kings and priests to Yahweh, even his Father, to him is the glory and the might forever and ever. Amen. So we see that Yeshua has honored us not to be just servants and slaves, but he's exalted us to be kings and priests and brothers and sisters with him and to rule on the earth. Uh, one of, if not probably the largest Sabbath keeping organization on the face of the earth today called the Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, I don't know where they got this from, but they believe that the millennium is up in heaven. And that everybody on the earth dies. You can't get that from reading the scriptures. Because the millennium is on the earth. Isaiah 65, 17. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. says, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. And the former things will not be recalled. And they shall not go up on the heart. However, be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create in Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join my people. And the voice of weeping and the voice of crying will no longer be heard in her. There shall not still be an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. For the youth will die the son of a hundred years, but the sinner, the son of a hundred years, will be accursed. And they will build houses and live in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat the fruit. They shall not build and another live in them. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of the trees are the days of my people, and my elect will grow old to the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for terror. For they are the seed of the beloved of Yahweh, and their offspring with them. And it will be before they call, I will answer. While they are speaking, then I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed as one, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust is the food of the snake. They shall not do evil, nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says Yahweh. It's very clear. We have messages on this. We have, I believe it's uh, Bible Lesson 6, The Reward of the Saved, clearly showing that the millennium is not in heaven. The millennium is here on the earth. And that's the whole point of the millennium, is the redoing of the earth like the Garden of Eden. Uh, Verse 11 of chapter 5 of Revelation. And I saw and I heard a sound of many cherubs around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and their number was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands or myriads of myriads. That comes from Daniel 7 and verse 9. If you go to Daniel 7 and verse 9. I was looking until the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days sat whose robe was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like flames of fire, its wheels like burning fire. So the throne of Yahweh. A stream of fire went out and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him and ten thousand by ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Talking about the white throne judgment there. So we see this though. It's uh, poetic in form that Yahweh is saying, you know, thousands upon thousands and ten thousands upon ten thousands. Verse 12 of Revelation 5, saying with a great voice, worthy is the lamb, having been slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and in the earth and under the earth and the things that are in the sea and the things of all of them. I heard saying to him sitting on the throne and to the Lamb, be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might.
forever and ever. Wow. So here it is saying to the Father sitting on the throne and to Yeshua the Lamb, showing equality in worship and equality in blessing to both of them. Philippians uh, 2 and verse 5. Philippians, the second chapter in verse 5. We see the same thing. And this is for people who don't believe Yeshua did not pre-exist or they don't believe he's Elohim. How do you get around this? You'd have to not believe in the book of Revelation. Because if what they're saying here, giving equality of Yeshua with Yahweh, if he was a created being, then it would absolutely be idolatry. But Philippians 2 and verse 5 says, For think this within you, which mine was also a Messiah Yeshua, who existed in the very form of Elohim, thought it not robbery to be equal with Elohim. But he emptied himself, taking the image of a servant, having become in the image of the sons of men. And being found in form like a man, he humbled himself, having become obedient unto death, even the death of a torture stake. For this reason also Elohim highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth, those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Yeshua Messiah is Yahweh the Son to the glory of Yahweh his Father. Clearly two beings in giving the same. John 5 in verse 20. Book of John. Verse, chapter 5 in verse 20. It says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things which he does. And he will show him greater works than these in order that you may marvel. For even as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he wills, right? Only Yahweh can give life. You know, so Yeshua would have to be Elohim be ordered to do this. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, Yeshua, even as they honor the Father. The one not honoring the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So again, if Yahweh and Yeshua are not co-equal in both eternal beings, this would absolutely be idolatry if he's a created being. There's no way you could give the same honor to Yeshua as you give to the Father if he's a created being. And the last verse here. Revelation 5 and verse 14. And the four living creatures, we read this from the last time we talked about them, said, Amen. They, in faith, they said, so be it. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the one living forever and ever. Again, showing the universal sovereignty over all the earth when the kingdom of Yahweh comes. Wow. So, we really see now, as next week we'll be getting into the uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and this, this all six seals of Revelation, the seventh seal just opens up to the trumpets. But what we see here is before we can actually get into the seals, before we can get actually into what's happening in our day or ready today, we had to have a whole chapter showing the sovereignty and the glory and the honor and the worship and the praise of both Yahweh the Father and Yeshua, the Son and the Lamb of Yahweh. So what a great chapter. I pray that it was a blessing to you uh, to hear it as a blessing to me to give it. And until next week, Shabbat Shalom.